Finance is not just about Wall Street. It's about our everyday life. And it's not an end goal. It's a means to an end. It's what gets us to where we want to go. So when we think about how do we move money from today to tomorrow, or from tomorrow to today, we're asking questions about finance and how to use finance to, to manage our life. When we want to move money from one place to another, that's a finance question. And we, we want to be more resilient to manage uncertainty. That's also a finance question. Now, there's lots of areas where we don't even notice that we're using finance. So I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow for a bad shoulder. I didn't even have to think about health insurance. I have health insurance. It paid for the doctor's appointment. All I had to think about is making the appointment. I, have, I get paid by Yale. I don't have to think about that cash and where it goes and how it gets paid out. It happens automatically. Even for long-term retirement savings, it happens automatically. It's out of my mind. But a lot of things have changed. So what, I remember when I was 13 years old, I lived in Florida. I was spending the summer at Duke University. Halfway through the summer, I needed more cash. I had to travel for three hours and spend an hour with a bank manager filling out forms just to get $100 in cash. Right? Whereas yesterday, I needed more cash for a taxi, and I went to an ATM, and in five seconds, I had it. Right? We take these things for granted. But one thing that we have to realize is we take it for granted, but a lot of people do not. A lot of people in America do not take it for granted, and even more people in developing countries do not take it for granted. At the end of the day, I want to talk about, first, I want to talk about credit as an example of one of the most important tools of finance. So the first thing that's striking is I can name two different organizations for you right now. You can get a tax deduction for supporting either one. One of them is working tirelessly here in America to help people get out of debt. The other one is working tirelessly in developing countries to help people get into credit. And these are similar loans with similar terms and conditions. How can we get a tax deduction for both things? Well, the one answer is that a loan is not inherently good or bad. Remember, it's a means to an end. We have to think about how it's getting used to try to understand whether it's playing a helpful or hurtful role in somebody's life. One of the things that's striking is the power of language. I don't know if you noticed, but when I talked about that first organization, I used the word credit. The second one, I used the term debt. Right? Credit is good. We earn credit. Debt is bad. We get loaded up with debt. We get approved for credit. We're burdened with debt. The language we use tells us a lot about our opinion. But the reality is, it's not that simple. So how do, we, how do we go about figuring out whether credit is something that's good or not to be promoted? One of the things that is striking about some of the research, which I'm going to share with you in a moment, is how we have learned that the big microcredit movement, which had huge promise in developing countries, promised to basically offer small loans to women who had no access to credit, to give them the opportunity to build businesses that they had no opportunity to build without access to credit. With that business, their, bu their incomes grew. With that extra income, they could feed their children. They could send their children to school. They could go to the doctor. They could have more power in the household. And they could get out of poverty. That was the canonical story that had been told for many years about microcredit. One of the things that we've learned through some of the research is that the, one of the potentially biggest impacts of credit has been about resilience about managing risk, which might make you start to think, well, why are we doing loans then? Why aren't we thinking about insurance? If the big benefit is about risk, let's think about insurance. And in fact, I'm going to tell you about some insurance studies which had some pretty big impacts. But what I'm not going to do is tell you that insurance is a silver bullet. There is no silver bullet. There are huge problems, and there's no single solution. And one of the things that we have to remember to do is to lower our ambitions a bit. That's the reason for the title of this talk, Pragmatic Optimism. There are things that work. There are ways that we can make the world a better place. There are problems we can solve. But we have to be pragmatic about it and figure out what is actually working and what is not. So let me give you a concrete example of what I mean by this into the space of credit. And it also tells you a little bit about the journey of how I got to be doing this type of work. So in 1992, I was an investment banker for two years out of college. And heard about microcredit, and it really appealed to me. It was the story I just told you about helping hardworking entrepreneurial women fighting their way out of poverty by giving them access to credit. So before going to business school, I took what was intentionally, originally a small detour in my life to go to El Salvador and work for a microcredit organization. <clears throat> and two things struck me when I got to El Salvador. The first 
was that everybody talked about client retention as a really important objective. That it was a metric of success to keep clients in this, in this program, keeping them borrowing. And I thought to myself, well, I don't understand. If these businesses are going to grow forever, then of course, then that could be a good argument. But they're not, right? They, they get to some point and then they plateau, and that's a, probably a good thing. But then why aren't they just paying down their debt and, letting, and living off of the income of that business? Why is, why is client retention a good thing rather than a sign of actual failure? So the second thing that really struck me were the interest rates. Now, this is 1992. This is before the internet. I didn't know what the interest rates were. When I went down there, I have learned that the interest rates were 72% for this lender. This is a nonprofit organization. Now, I've since learned that 72% is actually what, it, it, it's not unreasonable to be perfectly blunt. We, it's, it's, it's cost recovery, it's expensive to do what they do. But it begged the question, what are these women doing with the loans if 72% loans is being done in the name of poverty alleviation? What, what is the impact? So I asked this organization, what, is, what, do you you know, what do you have? It wasn't my day job, it was my night curiosity. What do you have in the way of impact studies? And they showed me their report. This report satisfied their donors, it satisfied their senior management, it satisfied their board of directors, and to be honest, in no slight to them, it was really not much different than what I was seeing from other organizations. So I remember they had three questions on this survey that they asked their clients. Are you eating better than you were two years ago? Are you healthier than you were two years ago? Is your business bigger than it was two years ago? So they got resounding yeses to all three of these things, and they said, okay, great, see, that is evidence that we caused these things to happen, and microcredit caused these benefits. So here's a fourth question that they could have put on their survey, and they did not. Are you older than you were two years ago? <laughs> Suppose they did that. What would the headline of the report say? Microcredit causes aging, right? <laughs> so, you know, obviously, there's, a, there's an analytical gap here, and the point is that lots of things are changing in these people's lives over time. Everything from time to macroeconomic conditions to markets changing to other NGOs, government programs. You have to have a comparison group. That's really basic, right? Now, so what do we mean when we say, what is the impact of something? The impact question succinctly stated says, how have the lives of people in a program changed? That's kind of the easy part. The second part, though, is the harder. Compared to how they would have changed if the program did not exist. That's the heart of what we have to figure out. So, so we have to have a bunch of people who didn't borrow. So what do we do? Let's go back to this example. Suppose we did those same questions, and we went to a bunch of people who were not borrowing in the community. And we asked them those questions. Would we be satisfied? Well, let's go back and remember what the claim was that was being made. This is a program which is reaching hardworking women, fighting their way out of poverty, entrepreneurial women. Suppose we took a community and we divided it into two groups, the hardworking ones and, well, I guess the not so hardworking ones if they're not the first group. Who's gonna do better over time? With no intervention, no nothing. The ones who are hardworking. That's what we mean by hardworking. So we can't just go and find people who are not part of the program and say they're our comparison group because they're not hardworking the way the ones who are joining are. So we have to have some other way of getting at the causality question of what caused the change to happen. Now, the critics of microcredit have actually the same exact problem. There's been some huge tragedies that took place in India over the past few years, um, accusations of over-indebtedness, suicides that took place with people who had loans. Now, the problem the critics have is the same exact problem the proponents have. There's no attribution, no ability to say whether microcredit caused those things to happen or whether they just coincidentally happened. For all we know, the microcredit might have actually saved lives by, peop by helping people who were in their most desperate moment and giving them access to something that allowed them to solve their, their, their problem in the worst of times, but it didn't solve the problem for everyone. I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying we have no idea by just looking at this correlation. So rhetorically, this, this debate that we see in the media sometimes reminds me of my shower this morning. So, the shower, I got in the shower and the, 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 the water was scalding hot and I flipped it over and, and then, I got, then I was freezing cold and then I flipped it again and I got scalding hot and it took me a minute or two, I got it right. But that's basically where the rhetoric is. So we have two choices. We can be like this guy here, the masochist in the shower, and we can just let it be and we can accept the rhetoric swinging us from one side to the other, or we can be pragmatic optimists and say, wait a second, there's gotta, this, is, this in theory does make sense that this can help some people, 
and let's be pragmatic about it and figure out when it's going to work and why and how to do it best. And let's accept the fact that the two extremes are probably not correct in the absolute. So, so what have we actually found? Um, or wh how have we actually found it first, let me say, is by setting up randomized trials. Now, this is the standard we would expect of a pharmaceutical drug that we took. We would not take a pharmaceutical drug for ourselves if we did not think it had gone through some sort of rigorous testing, a treatment group, a control group, and know that it actually caused the outcomes to happen that we expected to happen. And, and this movement that, 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 that is taking place is about using the same rigor, the same demand for understanding what is actually working to problems in society. Now, this is not a technical talk or methodological talk, so I'm not going to get into all the details. I just want to have a few caveats just to be clear that you can't use them everywhere. Right? There's questions that are off the table. Um, but it's amazing with a little creativity how far we can go by setting up studies of this, of this sort. So what have we found? We found that microcredit does produce some benefits. They're modest. We do not see millions of people being lifted out of poverty. But we do see people managing risk better, and that's a striking result, particularly since it's a loan rather than insurance, which we're going to come to in a moment. Now, in South Africa, we had a study that was working with a lender that was doing astronomically high interest rates, 200% APR. It really was not microcredit by the way most people talk about it. They were not even targeting entrepreneurs. They were targeting salaried people. But what we found was when people took out these loans, they were doing it, some of them, because they had some bad shock that happened in their lives and they needed the loan to help absorb this bad event, whatever it was. And that loan allowed them to keep their job and it was the only one of the studies, ironically, that actually led to an increase in average household income because of this kind of right tail of people who were going to have some bad shock and it helped them. Now, this doesn't mean in the name of poverty alleviation that we should be walking around making loans at 200% APR, and that's the answer. But the answer is it tells us that we need to think about risk more, and we need to think about how to manage risk. Okay, so let's flip to another option, savings. Savings is obviously a very common way of managing risk. In fact, it's much cheaper if you can do it, if you can plan ahead. So what is, the, what is the problem with savings? So first of all, what do we mean? You know, we have a lot of interventions out there, a lot of programs that are trying to help people save more. What does it mean to say someone is under saving? So let's first start off with what it's not. So I think if I asked everybody in this room to raise their hand if they wish they had more savings, everyone would raise their hand. Right? So it's not just saying, well, we just need to figure out how to get incomes up to help people save more. It does remind me of one of my funniest lines from The Simpsons. Homer turns to Montgomery Burns and says, Mr. Burns, you're the richest man I know. And Mr. Burns responds, yes, but I'd give it all up in a moment for just a little bit more. <laughs> so, so we know that's not, that's not obviously uh, an actionable policy. So what is it that we mean when we say under savings? So now I'm going to be a dork again. I'm going to tell you what I mean, what, how I look at problems as an economist. I start off by assuming that markets work. It's my job. That's what I was trained to do and trained to think. But I was also trained to think that they don't work always. And now the challenge and the insights that we get about how to set policy and how to think about what to do comes about by figuring out when they don't work, why? What's the actual problem that's taking place? And when we know the why, then we can, it leads us down the road to thinking about what the solution is. So in the world of savings, I'm going to divide things into two very broadly speaking categories. Call them transaction costs and call them behavioral. Transaction costs. If we're in a developing country, a really, really rural area, people cannot get access to savings and find themselves doing things like this in order to save. Behavioral are things like, I have so many things I have to pay attention to I forget to save, or I, have to, I don't save because my brother is going to come demand the money from me or my husband or my cousin, and so I don't even bother saving. Or temptation. I don't save because little things get in the way every day, and then I never end up saving up for what I want. Temptation can be a big issue, and it cuts across rich and poor. So I take a look to my own life, for instance. My temptation, biggest temptation, is a nice dessert in a restaurant. If I go to a restaurant with my wife, my, my best option, my best outcome that I want to achieve is to have wine and dessert. My kind of middle tier option is to skip the wine, um, skip the dessert. My absolute worst option is to go and have the wine and the dessert. 
So what do I end up doing is I go and I skip the wine and skip the dessert. I just go to number two. Why? Because I know that if I have the wine, when it comes time to dessert time, my self-control kind of goes away and I order dessert. So I end up in this middle best, which is most unfortunate. So what I do when I'm out to dinner with a friend is I say to their friend, I'll give you $100 if I eat dessert. Now I can order my wine because when dessert menu comes, I'm not going to spend $108 on dessert. <laughs> right? I don't care how much wine I've had. That's nuts. Now, that's my way of dealing with things. And that's my, simple, that's my simple way of tying myself to the mask, like Odysseus. It's basically about increasing the price of your vice, lowering the price of virtue. Now, I can't call the M&M's Mars company up and ask them to raise the price of peanut and M&M's for me because I'm eating too many of them. They won't do that. So how do you go about doing this? Uh, there's many ways one can do it. One way that we created a, is a website called Stick. And Stick allows individuals, we have a few hundred thousand users, who can go and sign their own contract, kind of like what I did for dessert. Um, but you can do it over weight loss and smoking. And it also works for positive incentives when there's a third party that wants to see people lead their lives in a different way, like corporate wellness programs. One of the important lessons, though, about behavioral economics is that context matters. Right? It's not so easy to predict what someone's always going to do. It doesn't mean we act randomly. Right? But the, the, we, there, there are deviations, and they're sometimes hard to predict. So here's one of my favorite slides on this matter. <laughs> so if we have a model for these two people, they're exercisers. They're going to go take the stairs. But they don't. They take the escalator. The other important lesson from this is how easy it is to get people to move, to nudge them. A friend of mine put a sign on these that said, seven calories that way, and, and got noticeably more people taking the stairs. So. So let me now talk about insurance. So in Ghana, we went to farmers, farmers in northern Ghana who were not investing as much as they could in their farm. And we asked them, why? Why aren't you? And we got two answers. Some said rainfall risk, huge, either floods or drought. And so I'm not putting as much money into the farm as I could or because of the risk. Others said, I don't have the money. We wanted to know, which is the really the driving source here? Or is it both? So we set up a randomized trial. And we gave some people rainfall insurance that paid out only if there was a drought or a flood. Other people, we gave them cash. We found that the rainfall insurance made a much bigger impact on getting people to put in more fertilizer, hire labor, and, and start harvesting fallow land. So risk really matters. But this is not an easy intervention to do, necessarily. This is the face of trust. This is Hakeem. He works for Innovations for Poverty Action, the nonprofit that I started in, in, in Ghana. Well, we're all over the world, but in, he lives in Ghana. And he was delivering money to households as part of that insurance. So the, one of the challenges with rainfall insurance is that, yes, it's there to mitigate risk, but if you don't know what it is, you have to trust the insurance company. That's yet another risk to take on. So someone who wants to mitigate risk might not take it on, not because of the rainfall, because they don't trust the insurance company. So we need to figure out how to clone Hakeem, who goes out in floods and delivers cash to people in order to build trust. Um, so ultimately, these are all different stories about how risk really matters. So that's why I'm going to leave you with two thoughts. One goes back to the first part of the talk and the second to the second. The first is that we have to be humble. We have to realize that we can easily make ideas sound grand. Rhetoric is easy to sound wonderful. But we have to check our emotions at the door. We need our emotions to get us to the door. We need to, we're at the door trying to solve problems because of our emotions, because we care. But once we're in that room and figuring out what to do, we, we got to put our mind on. We got to let our mind guide us towards figuring out what's really working and what's not. And the second is about risk. And it's a recognition that we need ideas from all areas. So we need help in this journey to help manage risk better. We need it from people who are innovators to produce better products. We need it from people who are business innovators to help understand how to run businesses that help manage things like insurance companies. We need communicators who can help sell things better. Take Hakeem, how do we sell rainfall insurance? Right? We, need, we need to understand how better to explain that certain products do actually help mitigate risk. And of course, we need more data. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a dork. We need better data to understand what is really working and what is not. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. It's a pleasure.